and welcome to this week's Ask the Gardener here on the Irish Gardener on Facebook where I do my little bit to help with your gardening questions and, and give guidance where I can. Um, going straight into them actually, I have a question here from Fifi. How do I get rid of green fly in my garden? They are all over my roses, my clematis, everything. How can I prevent this problem year after year? Well, Fifi, success in the garden depends upon, above all things, maintaining the natural balance. And, and what that means, in essence, is that by ensuring a wide diversity of species in the garden, both plant and animal, that prevents the unnatural buildup of any one species, such as, in this case, green fly. So what you need to do, ideally, is ensure a good, healthy supply and population of predators in your garden. And the predators for green fly, believe it or not, are ladybirds. One ladybird will eat up to about 30,000 green fly in its life. I have no idea who counted, but that's, that's what I'm told. Um, so the last thing you want to do is go out there with an insecticide to kill the green fly because that's going to upset the natural balance. You're going to end up damaging bees, which are obviously critical to, to our own very existence and are under threat at the moment, and other pollinating insects. And they're also very likely to kill the, the, the ladybirds and other predators, okay? So that's the first thing. Don't go out there with a nasty chemical. What you can do in the first instance, what I was just doing before I started, is cutting back. So if, you, uh, you, if it's practical, now it may not be practical in your situation, but if you have a green, green fly infestation on a rose bush or a clematis, if it's possible, just cut off the stems that are worst affected and throw them out. Uh, and that gets rid, of the, it gets rid of the problem in one go. But after that, what we want to do is we want to concentrate on helping the plants to help themselves, if you like. So you can do that in several different ways. One way is to create a garlic wash. So if you pulp some garlic, uh, mix it with boiling water, Google it, you'll see there's loads of different recipes and different methods of doing it. Uh, you're creating an infusion of garlic mixed with water. Do this outside because believe me, the smell isn't great. You could even mix in some chili, chili, uh, chili seeds as well because uh, to, to, that will deter aphids and other insects. What you do is you wash it onto the, 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 spray it onto the plant, in this case your roses and clematis and things like that. And what it does is it doesn't kill anything but it will uh, make the plant completely unpalatable to aphids, caterpillars, things like that. There's another product then, I think that's, yes, that's it to hand there, I'll hold it up there. It's grazers, right? Grazers do a range of products all based on calcium, right? So again, you're not killing anything. You're treating, feeding the plant with calcium and depending on the formulation, you have different formulations for different pests. And again, what it does is just makes the plant completely unpalatable to aphids. So the one you want is that one, which is grazers for the cabbage white fly and caterpillars and aphids. Very, very effective. You do need to repeat the application a few times, but very, very effective. That, and you can also, of course, uh, get ladybird towers and create little things to encourage ladybirds in your garden. In fact, you might be surprised to know that you can actually buy ladybirds online. Uh, but the, most, the best thing is to try and encourage them in your garden by creating a safe, chemical-free garden in the first place. Uh, and that should help with that problem, Fifi. Linda has sent in a question too, and it's a long one, but it's, it's, it's a relevant one. A lot of people will be, be interested in it. Good afternoon. I need advice on planting a wildflower meadow. I planted up my area on April the 20th, watched water, kept the birds off it, and I have nothing yet growing. I think the frost may have got the seeds, or else the seeds were useless. useless. It was from a large box I bought in my local co-op. Firstly, should I now wait until September, as it seems a shame to miss out in the summer? And secondly, do you have anything appropriate for sale? You have some boxes for 9 99 do you have anything larger, or where might I get some really good seeds from? I'd love a real mix, foxgloves, etc. too. Thanks for any advice. Well, Linda, I don't know if the, if the seeds were any good or not, or if it was the frost, obviously. I don't know what, what happened there, but in answer to the next part of your question is... Uh, should you wait till September? And the answer I would think is yes. I wouldn't be sowing wildflowers right now. We're going to have a long, hot, glorious summer. I hope in here for the next six or eight weeks at least. But in September, your best months for, for sowing wildflower seeds, March, April, and then September, October. Um, in answer to the, the next part of your question, yes, uh, you, I have nice native mixes. I don't have that many left, but I do have nice native Irish wildflower seeds, the biodiversity mixture, which is on the, the, my own website, theirishgardener.com. That does contain foxgloves and cowslips and plenty of other native Irish wildflowers. But the thing to, to, to remember here is when you're sowing wildflower seeds, it's not a quick fix. It's not a quick, uh, you, won't, you won't get results instantly. It's not like instant gardening if you're planting up containers and things like that. So when you put in a wildflower seed mixture, 
You'll expect to see some uh, colour year one from your annual plants. So most good mixtures will have a mixture of annual, biennials and perennials. So what that means is year one, as I say, you'll expect to see some colour as the annuals come into flower. Year two, then you'll have more annuals come into flower, the seeds from the original annuals, but also the biennials, which take two years to flower. So they'll obviously be flowering in year two. And then you'll also see from year, the, the beginning of the perennials in year two will start to flower, but from year three onwards, it's when you really begin to see a species rich meadow or wildflower area as the perennials begin to take proper foothold at that stage. Plus you're always going to get more and more annuals as the seeds disperse back into the ground year on year. So it is a slow process. Don't lose heart if you don't have results after a couple of months. It, it does take time. But in answer to your question, uh, in a blatant plug for my own website, the, the native Irish biodiversity mix uh, is a very, very good one to go for. And that does contain foxgloves, among many other species. So hopefully that helps you with that one, Linda. Susan, I think, has sent in a picture. Hi, Peter. My Christmas tree seems to buy, be dying in the centre. Any help or advice would be much appreciated. Can we? Can I get a closer image of that, I wonder? I don't know if it's dying in the centre, Susan. I can't really see properly, I'm afraid. I, well, not that I can't see properly. I can see a big gap, but that doesn't look, from what I can see in that picture, to be any kind of obvious sign of disease or discolouring or anything. I think it might be something environmental, like maybe the, maybe the wind, maybe, maybe a, a branch in the middle blew off in the wind or maybe it got too heavy. From what I can see, it doesn't look to be dying as such, it just looks like it's lost a bit of shape. But maybe I'm wrong, maybe there are signs of discoloration. If you could send me in some close-ups or closer pictures of, of the affected area, I'll certainly try and see it for you, Susan. But from that picture, no, it doesn't look too bad. It just looks like uh, maybe a branch is missing or the wind blew it to one side or something and it's growing that way. I know that sounds like a vague answer, but but uh, do if, if there are brown areas on it or anything like that, send me in a picture and I'll see if I can help Susan, okay? Uh, and then I have a question then from Violet. Violet said, hi, Peter, could you recommend a cream climbing rose that doesn't get black spot? I've got an iceberg climber, but I'm tortured with black spot. I've tried everything, but nothing is working. Thanks, Violet. Violet, iceberg is one of my favorite uh, of the white roses, both the, 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 the bush one and the climber. But I gave up growing it because I, I agree with you. You'd be tortured from black spot with it. It's absolutely so prone to it. I just gave up on it because, you know, life is too short and there are too many other good white roses uh, that don't get black spot or certainly they're more resistant to it. I'm not going to say there's any that in your question that doesn't get black spot because I wouldn't say there's any that are immune to it. But there are many which are um, very resistant to black spot. One uh, is creme de la creme. It's from Peter Beale's nursery in England, the Peter Beale's rose. That's a gorgeous kind of off-white climber. Uh, and the other one, it's um, Pat Austin. It's Claire Austin. I know it's Claire Austin. It's uh, the David Austin Rose Nursery. Claire, I think, was it was his daughter. So it's P Claire and Pat. Pat is the orange one. Claire is the white. The white climber is uh, Rose Claire Austin uh, from the David Austin Nursery. That's another lovely kind of creamy white one, strongly scented. And both that and Creme de la Creme, I would say, are definitely black spot resistant without being immune. Okay, I'm covering myself there, but they're two definitely worth looking to, worth looking out for to get to try and get. Another question on roses then from Margaret. I have a beautiful constant spry rose in flower now. When should I prune it as it's getting leggy and by how much? Well, Margaret, um, it's, it's a climber, so it's going to naturally get leggy and, and, and long, if you like. So the, 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 the time to prune it, to answer your question, is any time really between November and the end of February. It's time to prune all roses. But when you're, climbing a, uh, when you're pruning a climber, it's quite different to pruning a normal bush rose. So you need to identify, let's say, four or five of the main stems uh, and keep them climbing up whatever you want them to climb on. When they're at the height or the length that you want, then prune them there to stop them. And then the side shoots that are coming off them, you want to prune. It's difficult to do that without actually showing you, but the side shoots that are coming off those main stems, you need to cut them back to about two or three buds from the main stem, which could be about maybe six inches. So you're left with three, four or five main stems. Try not to have them crossing uh, and try not to have them too congested in the center. So less is more, if you like, it'll put on plenty of growth. So uh, identify those main stems, cut the side shoots back. So you'll be left with, as I say, these few stems going in different directions uh, with quite tidy side shoots off it. But the time to do it is any time between November uh, and the end of February, as I say. And Bernadette sent in a question here. Bernadette, Peter, my new apple tree, miniature in a pot, the little apple buds have split. Any idea of why and can I rescue it, please? 
I wonder if a little insect got in there, Bernadette. I'm not 100% sure from that photograph. It's quite common to see the skin of an apple splitting, and that's from what we call erratic watering. But you normally see it as the apple is bigger. Could be this erratic watering, but we've had quite a lot of water already this year. So what I mean is, uh, if a plant gets a deluge of water, and it's absolutely soaked, and then it goes through a dry period of, of a week or two, and we have had some dry periods, believe it or not, this year, that leads to, to the fruit splitting because it grows and then it gets dry so it contracts so that leads to the skin splitting that could also be a slug or something which ate it and just created the wound which is, is now opening uh, it's i'm afraid it's hard to say it's another vague answer it's hard to say on that one uh, but just do try and make sure particularly when it's in a pot it's more and more likely actually the more i think about it when it's in a pot it, it, it's very possibly the erratic watering because the pot can dry out it's not always getting watered by the rain so try and make sure that it's getting watered consistently. The ones that are split like that, prune them off because they're, they're a fungal disease and infection is only going to get in through that wound. And just try and make sure that you're watering consistently as opposed to soaking it one day and leaving it dry out then for a few days. That's what will, will cause more fruit splitting like that. Okay, now I want to, 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 to go to a chat that I had earlier in the week. It's do you feel like during the lockdown that you didn't do enough? I, I certainly do, because you hear of people that have done wonderful things during the lockdown period. And one of them is Leash school teacher Rachel Scully, who took it upon herself during the, the period of being locked down to write this wonderful, wonderful book. It's called The Wildflower Child. It's a kid's book, but uh, worth a read for adults as well. Uh, I won't tell you any more about it. I had a chat with her during the week. Have a look at this and see what you think. Rachel, hello, and thank you very much for joining me. Tell me, you're a, a, a national school teacher up in County Leash, originally from Kinlair. You've written this fantastic book, The Wildflower Child. Can you tell me a bit about the story for those who haven't, haven't discovered it yet? It's fantastic. Can you, can you share with us a bit of the story? Yes, yeah, so um, it's about a boy called Fergal, and he's a shy boy who spends most of his time in his garden, which is a wildflower garden. It's been overgrown. And... Um, he longs to join the other boys and ch girls across the hedge who are playing hurling, but he's a little bit more shy and he stays in his garden. Um, so I suppose that's the <laughs> that's his, it's most the beginning of it anyway. Um, so yeah, I wanted to create a story with wildlife, you know, the wildflowers. You know. And your your own background, Rachel, is it? Um, were you were you, were you the shy girl in the wildflower meadow, or were you out playing the hurling? Uh, I was out playing <laughs> sport. Okay, um, okay. Yeah, as a, when I was younger, yeah. So um, I suppose my background about the, as a child anyway, I was outside, I loved the outdoors. I always spent time outside when I could. Um, yeah, and then I've always been interested in art and storytelling. Uh, and without, book. With, without, without spoiling it for those who haven't read, what, what, how does the wildflower child progress? So um, Fergal tends to his garden um, and one of the boys, um, his slitter comes in over the hedge and it disrupts Fergal in his garden and he ends up standing, the other boy standing on the wildflowers and he ends up hitting the, an ash tree with his hurl and it leaves Fergal feeling a bit outraged um, and Fergal confronts the boy about it and realizes that they don't really know a lot about nature or wildlife and don't have, share the same respect for it. So he feels a little bit excluded and isolated. Um, and he allows his emotions to overcome him and he ends up cutting down his wildflowers in a rage um, to then later realize that actually wildflowers do need to be cut every year. So the story ends, you know, in a nice, happy ending. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fabulous. So I, I remember when you were first, when you and I first spoke about this, I remember being so taken with the whole thought process that got you to this point. And, and it's just, I suppose it's never been more, more apt. The, 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 the message that's in there has never been more apt and more important than what it is now. And was this a lockdown project or, or what kind of, what motivated you? It was, yes, it was. So the schools closed and I found myself online, you know, trying to teach online, wasn't very used to that at all. Uh, and with a lot of free time on my hands. So I returned to all of the things that I had loved to do when I was younger, um, like art and drawing and storytelling. And I, yeah, I rekindled my love for the outdoors again. 
um, and for drawing. And I came up with some ideas and I contacted the publisher and they they liked my ideas. So thank goodness I'm, for that. I'm, I'm delighted. And what is your own? Yeah, I mean, obviously you're a teacher and but have you what other training did you have? Like, have you have you a background in training in in any of the, the horticulture, botany? I mean, there's childhood psychology obviously going on in, in, in your work, but also in the book. What, tell me yeah. more about your background. Um, so I trained in Pats in Dublin and then I went to Italy for a couple of years and I taught abroad in Milan. And there wasn't, I went hiking every weekend, but there wasn't much nature in school because of it being in a city. So then I applied for a master's in outdoor education and sustainability in Sweden. And um, Sweden, you know, Utta Skola means outdoor school. And out the outdoors is very much incorporated into all of aspects of education in Sweden. So while I was there, we did a module on sustainability stories. And I suppose that's where I got all my ideas and I suppose the training in it. Um, and I loved it. I realized, you know, I because I teach children and we, we use so many books every day, I thought, why not try create my own? Um, and then lockdown gave me the opportunity and the time to do it. And um, now that life is busy again, it's a bit harder to find the time, you know. Um, are, you, are you teaching the wildflower child in your own class? Yes. Yeah, so this year I am a, I'm a supply teacher. So I have 16 schools. Um, so <laughs> it's new after COVID. So I've had the opportunity to bring the books to all the schools and see how the children react with it and ask them if they like it or if they don't. And um get them drawing wildflowers and get them out outside you know with COVID now we're spending a lot of time outdoors it, you know with the ventilation inside it's not it's much better to, to get outside um, and the book is going down well yeah they really like the, I'm the story. I'm absolutely I'm chuffed to bits <laughs> to hear it and what age group are you are you teaching it to? Well I think I was actually surprised myself because I in mind when I wrote it I had it in my head for about second class and I actually found that sixth class students, which I was really shocked by, actually identified with it a lot more because, you know, there's parts of it where um, Fergal, he, he thinks he's been excluded and it's all in his mind more so than it's actually happening. And the sixth class students actually um, found it a lot. They it really connected with them, probably because, you know, the year they've had been in school, out of school and. Um, you know, they haven't really been able to, you know, they've been missed out on a lot of opportunities and spent a lot of time on their own. So I think the book kind of resonated with the, the older children a lot more. So they probably they probably had that bit more life experience, I suppose, which which might also be part of it, would you think? Yeah, I think I really do. Yeah. Yeah. But I have read it with younger children and with the younger classes. Now, there is quite a lot of text, so you'd read it to them more so yes, than them being able yeah. to read it themselves yeah. so yeah 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 I'm thinking of my yeah. own two little girls as the uh, uh, one is five and one is ten and I'm wondering which one would get more of, out of it and it's probably is the ten year old probably is a slightly older child I think um, so yeah <laughs> now, now that you are part of the system here in Ireland Rachel uh, I mean the education system that you're teaching within the education system to me it's an absolute given it's a no-brainer whatsoever that nature and the outdoors shouldn't just be part of our education system, but should encompass our whole education system because without it, we have nothing. Um, is that ever likely to, to, to happen in the Irish education system or are the powers that be open-minded enough, do you think? Is that a fair question to ask you? Yeah, no, I think um, now uh, more than ever, I think that is obvious that we need to get outside a lot more. Um, new schools now are being built with outdoor classrooms um, you know, the, the new schools more so, and um, that's part of nearly all new schools. Um, and teachers are bringing their children out a lot more. This year in particular, emphasis is on PE, which includes outdoor edge and adventure education and SPHE. So, you know, social, personal health education. So, um, yeah, I think we are moving towards that. Um, and it's really benefits children, you know, to be outside, like to develop a sense of place and to grow their own vegetables and vegetable patches to have their wildflowers outside yeah I do think children now they're being given, being given a lot more responsibility and time outdoors 
And I wonder, would it, will that, I mean, I know obviously in current circumstances, what you're saying about the outdoors and that out of necessity, um, but I wonder, will it spread into secondary school education that, you oh. know, there, there, there's a generation or, or maybe more than one generation, several generations at this stage who don't know how to grow their own food, for example, who don't know, who don't understand that you put a seed in the ground and it grows into a plant. And I, I was speaking at something recently and they were talking about from a marketing point of view in, in horticulture, it was actually to do with planting orchards. And they were saying for their message, they're constantly thinking, OK, will a five year old get the message? And I was saying, actually, you need to look at it the other way around. You need to think, will a 55 year old get the message? Because five year olds, as all of us, when we were five, we innately know how to, to put a seed in the ground or how to put a bulb in the ground. It's innate yeah. within all of us, but we lose it as we get older, unless unless it's being reinforced within us. So I really do think that that this book that you've written and the message messages within the book are so important at the moment and so so of the time uh, that the book should be taught at whatever age group it needs to be taught at. But the actual ethos of what you're talking about is something that needs to needs to be throughout the education, the world of education, right into third level. It, it, yeah, it is. I don't have experience now teaching in, you know, secondary school. Um, but having gone through the system like you as well, it is a lot harder because of the exam, you know, the focus on exams. But hopefully we will move away from that because as we've seen this year, you know, the leave and search has changed. Uh, students are being given options now. Um, you know, when I did my leaving cert, when you did your leaving cert, I'm sure it was totally, totally different. You did the exam and, you know, it's so hopefully we are moving more closer to that idea. Um, and now with staycations and staying in Ireland and, you know, when we were even confined within our five kilometre radius, as difficult as it was, it forced people to explore their, their locality, places close to them, people, you know, some some of my friends said to me, oh, you know, I've never been down to that park, like their local park, um, you know, and the lockdown helps. You have to find a silver lining, don't you? But, well, well, but, well uh, you, you do, but you don't have to dig deep because I think it's definitely you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's without question the, the strongest positive, if not the only positive to come out of the last 15 months has been our, our newfound and deeper appreciation for for green spaces, whether that's our own garden or the local park or, or the greater landscape in general. We've, we've a newfound and everyone seems to have a newfound appreciation of the importance of the green environment, which can only be good. And Rachel, thank you for joining us. Where can people get the book? So this is it here, The Wildflower Child. <laughs> and you can get it on the Book Hub uh, website. So it's uh, Book Hub Publishing. And um, that's where you can find it. Um, I urge I urge everybody watching to go out and get it, not just for their children, but for themselves also, particularly parents like myself. Uh, <laughs> it, it will it will help in many factors. Um, Rachel, delighted that you joined us today. Delighted that you're working, educating our children. Uh, and and thank you for your time and continued success and best of luck with the book. Thank you. Thanks for so much for having me on. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. The Wildflower Child, do go out of your way to get it because it's a fantastic book and a fantastic ethos behind it and reminds us how, how, how everything in life is so connected really, just nature and everything is so connected and congratulations once again to Rachel, fabulous, fabulous book. So moving back on to questions, Angela sent a question in during the week uh, and it's a lovely question actually, just wondering if you're familiar with grafting roses to a tree. Uh, I found a tree in County Clare that roses have been grafted to. And I would love to do this myself, see image. Any help would be greatly appreciated. So Angela, uh, nearly all roses are grafted. All, nearly all roses that you'll get in a garden centre are grafted. Okay, so you can grow roses from cuttings. But the reason that they tend to be grafted is because if you take seeds off the rose, it won't come true to type. So what that means is, if, if, well, number one, that it'd be difficult to germinate anyway. But if you take a seed from a particular rose, say that one, I'm not sure what that one is, but let's say it's Dublin Bay. And if you take a seed off Dublin Bay, it won't give you, a, it may germinate, but it won't necessarily be Dublin Bay that you get, okay, as a seedling. Uh, so you can take cuttings from Dublin Bay and that will give you a new rose, Dublin Bay. But the reason commercially that they're grafted is because cuttings aren't always 100% successful, okay? So they're grafted. So what that means in effect is we grow uh, what's called the rootstock, which could be the dog rose, Rosa, Rosa canina or something like that, from seed, because they will grow quite successfully from seed. And we use that as a root system for whatever cultivar rose we want to grow. So whatever hybrid, like Dublin Bay or Whiskey Mac or any of them. 
uh, and we grafted onto it at a certain point. So with, with shrub roses, it's grafted quite low in the stem, okay, so that the rootstock is, is just below the soil level and everything over the soil level is the cultivated form. And then if we're growing a standard rose, which is like a rose on a clear stem, you've seen them, you know, like the lollipops, if you like, where you've got a clear stem of one or two meters, and then the rose up here, well, the, that's grafted up at the top of that stem, and that's where the graft is if you go looking. So it's very difficult one, it's, it's a very specialist job in the first place, and difficult to explain anyway, even if I, if I was right next to you, but it's even more difficult to explain, I suppose, virtually and over a camera, and it's years since I've done it, probably since, not since I was back in college, and it's quite tricky. But what you're doing is you're, you're peeling off, you're exposing the, the un, just underneath the bark of the rootstock and then you have a little bud, it's normally budding which is a type of grafting. So you're, you're putting a bud from the cultivar onto the, the rootstock. So that little bud is referred to as a scion and you, you put that in and you're trying to match up the cambium uh, which is just below the bark of the scion to the cambium of the rootstock. So it's quite logical and, and, and then it, it, the xylem and phloem vessels knit together and all the growth then goes into, into the cultivated form and then once the graft has caught and has, is working, you remove what's left of the rootstock growth so that all the energy now goes into it. It's very logical and very straightforward, but it's quite tricky. Um, the time to do it is during the winter, or winter months, the end of winter, I think it's January, February, that you, you start grafting roses. Uh, but a tricky job, but give it a go. Uh, your best bet is, because I probably haven't described it very well there, so your best bet is uh, YouTube, go to YouTube, how to bud roses, how to graft roses, and that'll show you so, some good tips, I imagine. But best of luck with it, Angela, and do let me know how you get on with it. Now, Elizabeth Howard sent me in a question. Peter, I have a white lilac growing in my small city garden. It's just past flowering and beautiful. How do I prune it as the tree is getting very big and my garden is small? Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, you can prune it very, very easily. You just, you can kind of just hack it back if you like, bring it down in, in size and in shape. The time to do it is now actually just after the flowers have finished. However, the butt that's coming is, uh, you won't harm the lilac at all by pruning it and it will respond well to pruning by producing more growth. But that growth will be, tend to be leafy growth full of foliage as opposed to full of flower buds. It's just something that's quite peculiar to lilacs. They, they do respond with lots and lots of growth after pruning, but as I say, it's leafy growth. So you may end up with something less than what you wanted in, in that you'll have all this new growth, so it'll be just as big, but you'll have far fewer flowers. So I kind of don't know what way to advise you on this. It's not a plant I'd use in a small garden normally. I love lilac uh, and the white lilac. My mum had one growing through my childhood. I loved it, it was a beautiful scent from it and everything. But it had plenty, the one, I, the one my mum had, had plenty of space and didn't need to be pruned and it flowered well every year. And when you see them growing in small gardens uh, and you prune them, they tend not to flower as well. So I kind of don't know what to say to you, Elizabeth. Prune it now if you want in terms of size, but just bear in mind that it will probably be a couple of years before you get a decent display of flowers again. So look, good luck with it and let me know how you get on with it. Uh, Kerry has sent us in a picture, I believe. Kerry Sharp, uh, I'm redoing my garden at the moment putting in new beds and will need to move some of my existing plants. I have the following bush, but I have no idea what it is. It's one of my favorites. Do you recognize it? Can you help identify it? I'd like to read up on it before I try to move it as I'd hate to lose it. Can, is there a close up of that guys, I wonder? <clears throat> it looks to me, I don't know what it is, Kerry, off the top of my head from that picture. It looks like it could well be some type of viburnum. Uh, you might give me, send me on some more information, like even the colour of the flower or when it flowers, or if you have a picture of the flower, send that in to me. It does look like some kind of viburnum. It also looks a bit like one called Clerodendron, or it may even be Calicarpa, uh, which has lovely purple berries during the winter. But send me in a picture of, of what it does, if you like, the, the flowers are the berries. In terms of moving it anyway, you wouldn't move anything at this time of the year. Now it's fine to plant something that's growing in a pot, like this margarita or argaranthum. You can plant something like this because it's growing in a pot any time of the year. And I'll tell you why. Because if I take that out of the pot, there's no root disturbance whatsoever. Dig a hole, put it in the garden, that's fine. Just give it plenty of water. But taking something out of the garden, you can't do that at this time of the year because plants get the, that magical energy from the soil. They get it through the extremities of the root system, through the root hairs, which are microscopic, okay? So if we, if we dig down and dig out that root ball to take out a plant, it's unavoidable. We're going to sever some, if not all, of, of the extremities of the root system and, and leave the root hairs behind us. 
so the plant has lost temporarily its, its ability to take water and nutrients out of the soil okay so we can only do that during the winter months because the plant is dormant and it has a chance to repair that root damage before it becomes active in growth again in the spring every minute of every day now that the plant's root system is working so if we damage it now it, it will most likely die in fact that picture looks so established it'll definitely die if you try to take it out of the ground now so wait till the winter months get as much of a root system as possible and don't leave it out of the ground for any length of time, so straight into its new home after you've taken it out. Uh, so that's, that's the advice on how to move it as to what it is. My best bet is a type of viburnum, but as I say, do send me in a, a picture of the flower or even a description of the flower, uh, and I'll see if I can get that for you, Kerry, okay? Um, Jackie has sent in a question. Peter, can you help, please? We have this wedding cake tree in our front garden. has been growing there for over 20 years. Worried something is wrong with it. The top is very sparse. Many of the leaves are brown. We love it and don't want to lose it. I have given it a seaweed liquid feed. Well, Jackie, I don't blame you. I love the wedding cake tree as well. Awful, awful mouthful of a name, Cornus Controversa Variegata, but a really beautiful tree. And for anybody who doesn't know it, you can see why it's called the wedding cake tree from the tiered effect, the tiered way that it grows. That's the blooms in it there. It's suffering, unfortunately, Jackie, from a fungal infection. So you're right to be concerned I'm always very slow to, to touch them in terms of pruning because they have this lovely shape which comes naturally and we can interfere with it by pruning bits off it. However, in this case, I think I probably would prune off that infected growth up on top, okay? I think hopefully the shape will come good again. But prune off that, that branch that's completely dying because the fungal infection is in that and it's traveling down the stem as opposed to up. So take that off and remove it from the rest of the tree. Uh, get yourself some copper sulfate. I should have some. I always have some to hand. So get yourself some copper sulfate. I do. I have some there just to show you. But I mean, you'll get it anyway. Hold it up to that camera. Uh, get some copper sulfate. Mix it with water. That's the fella there. Uh, and what that is and what it does, it's, it's a, a broad spectrum fungicide, right, which offers a broad spectrum of control. Now, it is certified for use organically, but not willy-nilly don't be using it every week or even anything like it i would use it about once a year so you cut off the infected growth it's a bit like ourselves if we get an infection let's say we have an infection in a cut first of all you remove as much of the infection physically as possible then you treat it with a medicine in this case it's your copper sulfate and then you, you give us a tonic to build ourselves up same with the tree so you you've given it a tonic with the liquid seaweed i'd give it another blast of the liquid seaweed i'd use the nature safe one which is the irish one the organic liquid one from galway uh, feed it with that and then after that I'm afraid it's a question of cross your fingers and, and hope for the best but I would be confident that if you do all that it will it will come good for you now many of us uh, all of us I suppose uh, get so much out of our garden spaces and even if they're not our own garden spaces just access to public green spaces and as society is becoming more and more urbanized and more and more of us are living now in cities feeding these cities particularly the larger cities, the multi-million people population cities, is going to become, it's already, a huge challenge and will continue to be going into the future. Uh, Claire joined the Irish Gardener crew there recently and she went to visit an innovative project in a rooftop in Cork City. Have a listen and see what you think. Hi, I'm Claire and we're here with the Irish Gardener. We're in Corn Market Street in Cork and we're about to meet Brian and go up to Cork Rooftop Farm. Now we're up at the rooftop farm with Brian. So Brian, can you tell us a little bit about you know how you got started up here? So yeah, we got an initial delivery of say 20 cubic meters of, of soil, which is about 30 tons of soil. So we needed to be sure that the roof could take the weight. So that was why you know contacting an engineer was one of the first steps we did. Um, so we built these raised beds that you see here. Um, we got them at kind of 6 inch and 30 uh, and 12 inch depth so we do some of our leafy greens in the lower ones and more uh, root crops then such as potatoes which you see down the end and carrots and things like that in the deeper beds um, 
and we built all these from scratch using reclaimed materials such as the pallets and reclaimed wood and filled them up with the soil, sieved all the soil. It came from uh, down East Cork, all the soil, but we had to sieve out quite an amount of stone, so that was a bit of a back-breaking uh, job, but it was good because I had time on my side, so it was great. Um, Hard work and dedication, so from you and Ty. <laughs> yeah, exactly, but we enjoyed every step. Great, because you're, you're really managing to, you know, produce a, a lot, you know, out of mm -hmm. this small space. So yeah. can you just tell, do you know any more about the details of that that you could sure. tell us? Yeah, I mean, with the aeroponic tar farm, so we have, it's an 80 metre squared space and we're able to grow four and a half thousand plants in that space. So we're using obviously the vertical space and uh, aeroponics is a, it's a form of growing where we're using water only. There's no soil involved in, in the mm -hmm. growth process. Um, so there's a tank of water, a reservoir of water at the bottom, pumps the water up to the top and it trickles down, feeding and hydrating the plants. And that's all controlled on timers. Um, so we're able to grow a lot of produce quite quickly in a very small area and then supply it right to the people on our doorsteps. I know that traditional gardeners would think, oh, so soil is the only way to go, but do you think the quality of the produce is, you know, comparable? And Yeah, there have been nutritional studies into the into crops grown in the tar farms and they found that they're on a par uh, with soil-based growing. Great. Um, soil is obviously, like, if you can grow in soil, that's, you know, the, the best way to go. If you have, but we're on a rooftop, so everything that we do, we have to be mindful of both the weight and, you know, our resources. So with the aeroponic tower farms, we only use between 5 and 10% of the water needs, say, for a soil-based system. So it's a really, it's a fraction of the water usage. Um, and with the soil-based system, obviously, it's a lot of weight on the roof, so we just need, to, we can't grow as densely or as much as we would like. Um, but yeah, we, we compromise and then I think with the tower farms we, we've got uh, a good solution. But we also have six laying hens which we put in last summer. So again, just for ourselves to have that uh, natural protein source available to us. The hens are very healthy and they also have a dual purpose. So where they, their coop is is where we put all our food waste and all our garden waste. So it's actually our composting system at the same time in order for you know, plants to thrive and grow, you need pollinators. And uh, so we had to put in a meadow farm, uh, a meadow uh, uh, beds, should I say, to both help with the, the bees pollination and help with our plants to draw insects and beneficial uh, bees up onto the rooftop farm because this was just a gray, barren rooftop up until now. There was, it was devoid really of biodiversity apart from a scattering of pigeons. And it's really colourful up here, you know, I mean, in the middle of the city, it's yeah. amazing to see. And I'm sure, you know, people in the city respond really well to this story. And do you find like customers are quite supportive? Oh yeah, I mean, it's gas. We're overlooked here by quite a few buildings. So we get text messages the whole time of photographs of their new view. <laughs> uh, and they're very thankful for it. Cause again, they were just looking down at a big gray nothingness. Um, and we always get few hoops of the horn from the Paul Street car park um, but from the greater Cork area and even around Ireland it's been amazing the support we've been getting um, I think people really like the idea the concept as it's gone along more opportunities have kind of come about and one of those was an opportunity to do a market garden on, on ground level and um, so we've, we've a no dig market garden now out near Coachford on a dairy farm and we also have 400 pasture raised hens, so we're you know, cr you know producing an, uh, quite a, about 2,500 eggs a week and we have uh, a subscription box that people have subscribed to throughout the summer months now, so we're providing a rounded diet to, to you know, 40 families so, uh, within the city centre mm -hmm. and they come every week or every two weeks depending on their subscription and then the excess we supply to restaurants and to the public at the farmer's market every week. We harvest every Friday, generally for the market, but also then throughout the week we're harvesting for our restaurants. So we try and keep it really fresh for the restaurants. So the benefit of having us in the city centre is that they don't have to travel far to get produce, but it also means they have a lower lead time to getting stuff. So they can kind of text me in the morning, I need X amount of salad leaves and they'll have it that afternoon and it's been harvested that morning and it's on a plate that night. So even with urbanisation, you know, you're saying that you can still achieve like big things like this rooftop farm. Absolutely, I mean, this building has been here since the 1950s. Nothing's ever been done with the rooftop. 
Um, so I think uh, there's buildings like this dotted all over the city and I hope that this is the first of many rooftop farms. So where can people find out more or contact you, Brian? Yeah, so we're, you can hit us up on our website, which is corkrooftopfarm.e, or we're on Instagram quite a lot, and so our handle's at corkrooftopfarm, or you can check us out on Facebook and YouTube as well. Fabulous to see what Brian and the crew are getting up there in Cork Rooftop Farm in Corn Market Street. And is this the way that our, our city populations will be fed in the future? I mean, the, the, the cities and the green infrastructural elements in cities offer so much, not just as a space to offer food, but uh, he, he has hydroponic or aeroponically, he's aeroponically growing food, he's growing food in soil uh, up there on the roof. He's chickens up there, he has bees up there, wildflowers creating a haven of biodiversity in a city centre location and if you look at Cork as just one of the cities in Ireland and all the rooftops that we have, Cork is a, a city that has a problem with flooding, water coming on to gardens and rooftops and on green wall systems. This slows the water going into our storm drainage system. Uh, it's proven in Berlin and in London and places like this to slow the speed of water going into our, our storm drains by up to 90%. Uh, hard to believe that, that we're not looking at, at these elements, these green elements in, in city centres as a way of alleviating our flood problems. But who knows, maybe, maybe after the year that we've all had, some enlightenment is, is, is spilling into the powers that be because really nature offers us the answers, not just in rural situations, but perhaps even more importantly in urban situations. Uh, and what Brian is doing there is, as you say, he, he, as he said, he, he's getting text message in the morning from a local restaurant and the salad leaves and the herbs are being harvested that day into the restaurant and onto the customer's plate that evening. Really fantastic. And I think rooftop gardening uh, and growing the way he's growing in city centre location is certainly part of the way of the future. So well done to Brian on that. Now, thanks to all for watching. If I didn't get to your question, I apologise. I'll do my very best to get to them next week. Put in it your question here in the comments below and we'll, we'll save them for next week's show. Uh, and next week is going to be a very interesting one because Trish Taylor Thompson is joining us, botanical artist from Dublin originally. Uh, she'll be visiting the fantastic gardens in Avoca Mount Usher uh, and having a chat with head gardener there, Sean Heffern, in a really special place. So tune in next Friday at one o'clock to see Trisha walking around uh, Mount Usher with Sean. Until then, enjoy the garden and thanks for watching.